the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Deep Dive with the Institute for Justice. I'm Melanie Hildreth. One of IJ's most famous cases is Kilo versus New London. The story there centered on a working class woman named Suzette Kilo. Suzette fought back against her town's efforts to take her home so that it could turn her land over to a private developer who might use it to build something that would generate more tax revenue for the city. The case went before the U.S. Supreme Court in 2005, and it became one of the most reviled rulings in modern history. I'm here with IJ senior attorneys Bob McNamara and Jeff Rose to talk about the government's power to take your home or business and indications that the court may be ready to change course on what it will permit. Jeff, let's start with a recap of what happened to Suzette Kilo and why hers was such a landmark case. Sure. So the Kilo case was decided in 2005. Before that, leading up for several years, this case was litigated in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood of New London, Connecticut. And there, um, the, the city government decided that it was going to take um, a huge section of residential properties in order to engage in pure economic development. These weren't blighted properties, and these weren't properties that were going to be put to a traditional public use, like a school or a military base. And they weren't even being put to a traditional common carrier use, like a railroad. This was strictly take land from A to give to B for the purpose of economic development. And so the court acknowledged that this wasn't about public use, this was about public purpose. And so Kilo was about whether the US Constitution permits the government to take private property purely for economic development as its public purpose. And the US Supreme Court in a five to four decision said yes. And so Suzette Kilo and her neighbors lost their homes. And Bob, can you talk a little bit about what happened after the ruling came down? I mentioned that people were not very happy about it. Uh, what, what, once the Supreme Court has ruled, what is there to do in the immediate aftermath of that? So Kilo was, I, I think, the most reviled U.S. Supreme Court decision of my entire life. And I, I think Kilo is a great example of what happens when you lose a battle, but nonetheless keep fighting and manage to win the war. Uh, because people were outraged in Kilo. Kilo was, you know, the uh, the lowest point of sort of this decades-long slide into expansions of the eminent domain power and eliminations of any limits on the eminent domain power. And really, people saw Kilo for what it was. The rationale in Kilo was we're going to take this property and give it to someone who's richer, and the richer person will pay more taxes. And that's a rationale that allows the government to take literally anything. You know, any farm can be a business, any business can be a bigger business. Any Motel 6 can be a Ritz-Carlton. Uh, any house can be a nicer house. And so really no one's property was safe, and understandably that didn't sit well with Americans. And so two things started happening. Uh, one is a lot of state legislatures responded to Kilo by amending their laws to make it harder to do this kind of take from A and give to B condemnation that we saw in Kilo. Uh, and IJ went all across the country kind of fighting in state houses to help those reforms get passed. But the other thing that happened is that judges started looking at Kilo as well. Uh, you know, there's the U.S. Constitution, which the United States Supreme Court interprets, but every state has its own constitution. And what you started to see uh, first in the state of Ohio, which had the, the first state constitutional case after Kilo came down, is state high courts looking at it and saying, well, that, that may be the law for you guys. That may be what the federal constitution allows. But here in Ohio, here in Iowa, here in other states, uh, we have more rights. Uh, our constitution isn't going to stand for this kind of nonsense. We're not going to follow Kilo, and we're going to be more protective of property rights. And so Kilo really was, the, the day after Kilo was probably the lowest point for limitations on the eminent domain power, and things have gotten steadily better since then. So the case that you mentioned in Ohio, uh, IJ litigated one unanimously. That was a pure private-to-private -private transfer of, of exactly the kind that, that you and Jeff mentioned, where this could these properties could be put to better use. Um, it also, I believe, had a, an interesting kind of angle to it that wasn't present in Kilo, um, but is also present in, in a case that Jeff litigated in New Jersey, which is sort of the claim that the property that's being taken is in some ways defective. Could you talk about that? Um, sure. So one dimension of 
Kilo was that they said, this isn't blighted property. Um, and the reason why they made that distinction is because since uh, the mid-1950s, the U.S. Supreme Court said uh, the government can take blighted property uh, in order to engage in urban rehabilitation or urban renewal. And the Supreme Court actually said you can take non-blighted property if what you're trying to do is rehabilitate an area that on average is itself blighted. Um, and so one of the uh, beneficial aspects of Kilo is that the reconsideration of the government's eminent domain power also included a tightening up of the definitions of blight. Um, blight definitions were uh, under state statutes and under state constitutional law were very expansive. They were actually very similar to the economic development rationale of Kilo, where if you could show that a property wasn't being put to its best and highest use, that could be blight. And so the New Jersey Supreme Court, for example, um, held that its own constitution, which allows, expressly allows blight takings, that there has to be a real concrete nexus between the allegation of blight and the taking. It can't be merely hypothetical. It can't be gestured at. It has to be real. And so we saw courts and, sta and state legislatures tightening up blight. So they, they tamped down on both of the particularly bad aspects um, of eminent domain. When the outrage waned, as it always does, and the state level activity started to cool, what happened both on the on the blight front and on the the just genuine private to private private to private transfer front? Did people stop trying to do this activity because the law was so clearly against them in, in most states or in, in many states? Uh, did they, because the outrage had cooled a little bit, decide that they could get away with it? What what have you seen on the ground in the decade? plus since all of this went down. So two things happened in, in the wake of Kilo. One is that this sort of abuse of eminent domain became politically toxic. Uh, the, the public would not stand for it. And so you saw a, a real wane in the extent to which this power was being abused. Uh, and the other is what happened in 2008 was the financial crisis. Uh, when the financial crisis hit, it suddenly became much less attractive to be a real estate speculator. And that's really what this kind of eminent domain abuse is, is looking local government officials deciding that they are secretly genius real estate speculators and using their government power to seize real estate that they think they can put to better use. In 2008, that suddenly didn't seem like such a good idea anymore. And so things really quieted down. And what you saw in a uh, kind of as the years passed and the economy started to recover, is in the states where you hadn't seen these powerful legal protections, uh, the, the interest in eminent domain abuse started to creep up again. You started to once again see the kind of projects in 2012, 2013 that you really hadn't seen for a solid decade. Uh, one case we had also in New Jersey where the, the plan really was just to take a a huge plot of land, knock everything down, and then think really hard about what they might want to put there instead. And so we started to see after several years where there really wasn't abuse of eminent domain, there started to be, uh, once again, a resurgence, not in the states where we had won these protections, but in the, the states that had lagged behind in the, the movement to reform eminent domain. Right. And, you know, I would also add that one of the things that unfortunately happens often with Supreme Court decisions, good or bad, is that they become roadmaps for government officials about how to violate people's rights. So Kilo not only went against the property owners, but the basic thrust of the, of the main opinion was, look, as long as the government has a plan, a detailed plan, you hire consultants, you generate a lot of paper, you jump through hoops, you have... Uh, you know, essentially meaningless public hearings in which the, the conclusion is foregone, but you let people come in and have two minutes to express their disfavor. Um, as long as you do that, um, courts will start to warm up to this idea again. And so, like, not only do we see um, these kinds of developments or even blight even blight takings starting to just rise a little bit, but there's greater care in making sure you have the right consultants and you produce a sufficiently detailed report, at which point the court, even if it's a state that has tightened up its eminent domain, will say, oh, we have to defer to the legislative findings here because they've just been done so fantastically. Oh, and that, that is a fight we've had to have a lot. And I think Jeff and I have the same experience of you know, walking into court and the government saying, but we, we have a 500 page plan. 
And it doesn't really matter what's on any given page of the plan. It's 500 pages long. Uh, and it's actually been gratifying. Jeff's right that frequently these decisions can be a roadmap for how to violate people's rights. Uh, but it's been gratifying how frequently courts are rejecting that. Uh, in, in a case Jeff litigated out in California, in a mm -hmm. case I litigated in New Jersey, uh, where courts really are saying that that seems like a very long plan, but it doesn't seem like a very good plan. And so I'm not going to let you take this land, which is, you know, in, in a way, it's kind of a double-edged sword, because as soon as Kilo came down, we committed ourselves to kind of pushing forward and getting Kilo overturned. And one of the obstacles we have faced is that the, the only way to ask the Supreme Court to take an eminent domain case is for us to lose the eminent domain case in the lower courts. And really what we've seen, even in states where, you know, to be candid, the law is not as good as I would like the law to be, we're still managing to persuade courts that there are real limits and that what the government's doing in our case is far beyond those limits. While this is all happening in that sort of private to private context, what about other instances where eminent domain is used? Obviously, there's the traditional road and, and school, but are there other examples of a taking that's closer to a public use but still illegitimate? Sure. So one good example is a case that um, we filed in, at IJ about a hardware store on Long Island. And so this is the, the case of a pretextual taking. Uh, the government takes your property and it takes the property for the ostensible purpose of a legitimate public use, but the real purpose is just to stop you from being in business. So in the case of the hardware store, um, our clients, the Brinkman Brothers, it's a, a family hardware store that's been in business since 1976. It's grown into five locations. They wanted to open a new location of their hardware store in a small town on Long Island. The small town didn't want them. But the problem for them is that the hardware store conformed to all of the requirements of the zoning code and the building permits. And there was no way using the ordinary tools of property regulation to stop this business, which the, the town... Um, leadership didn't want because I think really because they thought it's tacky. They want to be like they they want to be a charming seaside hamlet, um, and they think that a hardware store that provides practical things for people in their real lives just is inconsistent for some reason with their vision of their own town. So they decided, well, we're going to take this undeveloped piece of property and we're going to call it a park, and not even just sort of a, the park you might think of with baseball diamonds or other kinds of development. This is a passive park, meaning they're not going to do anything to it. Um, so this is the cheapest possible form of eminent domain for them. They just pay the fair market value of the land and do nothing. The only purpose is to stop the Brinkmans from pursuing their American dream. And so if you're using eminent domain for an illegitimate purpose, even if it looks legitimate on its face, that is unconstitutional. And this is going to be a big fight. There have been a number of cases about this in which courts have found for the property owners. Most of these cases don't get litigated. We've seen many instances of this in the newspaper, but it's a, it would be difficult to hire a lawyer and say, I want you to spend a million dollars trying to prove that this legitimate public use is fake. Most people don't have that kind of money. It's extremely unlikely to win. So this case is very important for IJ to establish it. And we have to, we're actually borrowing from Justice Kennedy's concurrence in the Kelo case. Justice Kennedy said, if a taking appears to be pretextual, courts should look behind the veil. It's not enough that they wave a 500 page plan in your face. They actually have to demonstrate that the stated purpose is the real purpose, and we do that through evidence. So that's an example of a type of taking that we're doing, um, that, that we're litigating at IJ to expand protections for property. So the claims in that case are, they, they have to do purely with the, the pretextual nature of the taking, whereas in Kilo, it was, was like, okay, this is just not actually a public use. That, so they're, they're, the, the bottom line and what we're arguing is it's illegitimate, but the, the the rationale for that is different. That's correct. That's correct. So and and this is a the the thing that's especially difficult about the Brinkman case is that everybody agrees that a park is a legitimate public use. And this is a core legitimate public use. This isn't even around the margins. Um, and so the unsurprisingly, the the towns, the town of Southhold, um, which is the the city in the case has said, hey, what are you guys talking about? What could be more legitimate than a park? And has said to the court, no need to look behind the veil. Let's not waste any time looking at the evidence. If we say it's a park, it's a park. 
and forget about all those allegations in the complaint to the contrary. Um, so we are we are litigating this case not only to protect the Brinkman's property, but to protect everybody from this sort of pretextual taking and have courts recognize that evidence counts, not just the plan. And the question really is, you know, the eminent domain power is supposed to be limited for land that's needed for a public use. And the question is, does the government just have to say there's a public use? Or in fact, does it have to be needed for a public use? Because just destroying the Brinkman's American dream is not a public use. The, the government has to actually need the land for something. And the question is just whether that need has to be sincere or whether the government just needs to say magic words in order to strip you of what you own. That's actually a great transition to the other thing that I wanted to touch on, because there's been a lot of development in the law, including recently at the Supreme Court, on how eminent domain is used in the context of public utilities and, and pipelines. That is a very different uh, type of plaintiff from Suzette Kilo or a small town hardware store. Um, Bob, could you talk a little bit about the property rights considerations and, and what the law looks like when you're talking about takings for something like a pipeline? Sure. So Jeff mentioned earlier that eminent domain is used for, for public uses and also since at least the 19th century has been used for what are called common carriers. Uh, railroads were given the power of eminent domain so that they could lay their railroad tracks. And that common carrier principle has been extended to other things, uh, probably most prominently in the news these days, to pipelines for oil and gas. And a lot of that is sort of a, a similar problem where the question becomes, are there any limits on the power once these magic words are invoked? Uh, and in some states, the answer is still no. Uh, the, the process by which you become a common carrier pipeline in, say, the state of Louisiana is this. You announce that you are a common carrier pipeline. Uh, there's no government oversight. There's no actual government interaction with you at all. You just bestow upon yourself the power of eminent domain, and then you can take other people's land from them. Uh, in, in Texas, you just have to check a box. Uh, and the Texas Supreme Court has said you have to actually check the box and file the paper with the box checked. Uh, but that's how you give yourself the power of eminent domain. Uh, and it is an area where there hasn't been, honestly, a lot of talk about property rights, because a lot of the fights about pipelines are fights between environmental Fundamentalists on one side who don't want more oil and natural gas and sort of industrial development people on the other side who do want more oil and gas. And the people who get caught in the middle are people whose property is being taken to build these things who often don't have a voice in the process uh, and sometimes don't even have a voice in the very case where they're getting condemned. Uh, just this past term, uh, the federal government asked the Supreme Court to adopt a rule that said if someone's property was being taken for a federally authorized pipeline, uh, the property owner shouldn't be allowed to object to the condemnation when the pipeline company shows up in court with condemnation papers. That in fact, the only way to object to the taking of your land uh, should be to appeal the permit that allows the pipeline company to build the pipeline in the first place. Uh, once the government authorizes a pipeline, you as a property owner have to show up and say, wait, 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 I object to them being allowed to build this thing because years from now they might want to condemn my land for it. Uh, and of course, no one does this. It's the equivalent of if you get a letter in the mail that says your neighbor, there's going to be a hearing on whether your neighbor can build a deck. You don't go because you're not a jerk. You don't care if your neighbor gets to build this deck. Uh, and then, unbeknownst to you, years later, you discover that the neighbor's building the deck in your backyard and you should have said something years ago. Uh, and the Supreme Court thankfully rejected the government's position in that case. And so the federal rule is... You, you get to make your arguments about the legality of the condemnation in your condemnation case. Uh, but it's an area of the law where there's an increasing movement by property owners to vindicate their property rights rather than to vindicate the sort of environmental principles about whether someone should be permitted to build a pipeline in the first place. And I think it's it's healthy to recognize those as different questions, right? There's should it be legal for you to build a thing? And then there's should you be able to build that thing on something that is actually mine? That seems um, it, how, it, you know, just as an ordinary person looking at this, um, it, it seems like one of the instances where the limitations on property rights are pretty, re it, it sounds instinctively kind of reasonable because you don't want a pipeline that zigzags around or kind of cuts around, like, because nobody's going to want the thing going through their farm. It would be a lot nicer if it was going through their neighbor's farm. Um, so when you're, if you, if a property owner is challenging that, what kinds of things, I mean, in the rule of law that that you, Bob, or that IJ would like to see, 
what kinds of things would be the kind of um, rationale that they could offer for why it shouldn't go through their property? Not just like, uh, it's a real pain. Because it is, you know, it, assuming that it is a real pipeline for like an actual needed thing that will benefit maybe millions of people, um, what is there to say? Oh, so I, th I think that's exactly right. And this is an area where there isn't really a serious argument that says you can't use eminent domain this way full stop. Our argument in Kilo is that you just can't do this. Our argument in the Brinkman's case is you just can't do this. This isn't what the eminent domain power is for. Uh, the eminent domain power can be used for common carriers, has been for well over a century. Uh, but the, the court still has to satisfy itself that the condom nor is actually going to build the thing that it says it's going to build. And I think a great example of this uh, is the, the proposed Atlantic Coast Pipeline uh, that shut down last summer. The people who were building it announced they, they had given up. Uh, kind of the, the environmentalists and the people who were opposed to the pipeline had made it so expensive to build that they didn't want to build it anymore. And that was covered in the media as sort of a battle, again, between environmentalists and industrialists. But what no one really wrote about was the fact that literally days before they publicly announced they weren't going to build the pipeline, they were filing papers in court trying to condemn private land to build the pipeline. And the property owners were saying, wait a minute, why are you taking my land? You're, you're not really going to build this thing. Everybody knows you're not going to build this thing. And so you shouldn't be allowed to take my property and come and knock down trees unless you can really show that you're taking it to build the pipeline instead of taking it as part of this futile effort that we all know you're going to abandon. And that's the kind of thing the federal government wanted you to not be able to say. Uh, you can't say you can't use eminent domain for a common carrier full stop, but you can say, wait a minute, you're, you're taking my land and you're not really going to build anything. You're taking my land for no reason. And I want a hearing. I want a court to decide that this is actually authorized. Uh, it doesn't mean pipelines can't be built. It doesn't mean railroads can't be built. But it does mean that property owners still have real rights and can raise real objections. And those objections, like any other legal objection you have to losing your property, should actually be decided by a judge. Right. You know, and, and I would throw in one other thing um, that we would like to do at IJ, which is to allow people who are the subject of even a common carrier taking to be able to challenge the necessity of the scope of the taking. So, for example, the, the you know, if you've ever been driving down the highway and you see an overhead power line, for example, there's frequently a cut line. The power line is in the middle of cleared force that might be several hundred feet wide. Um, and so the, the takings can be really destructive and the ongoing maintenance of the common carrier can be really destructive. And so one of the things we would like is for the common carriers to have to establish that there is a real need for everything they take. And that if they're just saying to themselves, well, it would be easier for us to condemn like a whole bunch more or to run this thing through your family home instead of moving it like a little bit around to at least preserve your family home on the family farm, um, that, that you ought to be able to challenge those kinds of things because courts have said once the, the government or, or the common carrier has decided that the taking is required, the scope of the taking is essentially never subject to judicial review. So there's a lot that's happening in, you know, that er the protectual uh, takings that you were talking about, Jeff, and the, the pipeline area. But there's also some signs of life uh, in that that private to private kilo uh, circumstance. And I, I did want to talk about that since I alluded to it at the beginning. Um, Bob, can you talk a little bit about the the indications that we're getting that the court might be interested in revisiting kilo? And is that something that should make proponents of property rights and people who felt like Suzette and her neighbors were wronged, optimistic or concerned? I, I think we should absolutely be optimistic. I mean, IJ has been committed to overturning Kilo since Kilo came down, and we've always liked our chances. Justice Scalia, before he passed away, whenever he was asked in public about decisions of the Supreme Court that he thought were likely to be overruled, he would point to Kilo. He would say the backlash to Kilo demonstrated the court had gone too far there, and he didn't think Kilo was long for this world. Uh, and the, the modern court is 
is sending the same signals. Uh, just this past term, there was a, a case called Eichner v. City of Chicago that asked the Supreme Court to take up an eminent domain case and overturn Kelo. And it takes four votes. Four justices have to vote to take up a case. Three justices voted to take the Eichner case. Uh, and none of those three justices was actually Justice Alito, who has previously voted uh, to take IJ cases up that would allow him to reconsider Kelo. So we know there are at least four justices out there who are looking for a case. Uh, Justice Alito may have seen some, some problems he didn't want to deal with in the Eichner case itself, but there are now public signals from four different Supreme Court justices that they would like to take a case uh, to reconsider Kelo. And the great thing we have in pressing that argument is this wealth of state courts that looked at their own constitution and didn't really say, oh, well, our constitution uses different words and our constitution was adopted in 1927, so we're interpreting it differently. What they all really say is just, Kilo is wrong. Kilo lets you take from A to give to B for any reason or for no reason, as long as you're willing to say that B is richer than A. And that's wrong. That's wrong as a matter of constitutionality, and it's wrong as a matter of basic morality. And so we're, we're very confident that when this issue gets back in front of the Supreme Court, that Kilo is, in fact, as Justice Scalia always predicted, is not going to be very long for this world. It sounds like Eichner, for whatever reasons, procedurally or, or what have you, is not the right was not the right opportunity. If you could design, and and probably as hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do to design the ideal case to bring this back up, is it ex exactly another Suzette, or is there is it someone who is in a slightly different posture? Um, what would the perfect uh, end kilo case look like from your perspective? Right. So I think that uh, you know having a Suzette kilo, a heroic person who is defending her home against a pure economic development taking is the best fact pattern, not, not just because it's inherently the, be the best fact pattern, but also because it's the exact fact pattern of Kilo. And so it will squarely present the question of whether or not the Kilo doctrine is still viable. Um, so I would love to see that. I think what we're, the, 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 what we'll need is for some scoundrel in one of the notorious eminent domain abusing states to New York, New Jersey, New York, California. New, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, you're saying that, not me, but yeah, anyway. Um, it, New is, Jersey, is, New Jersey. Right. We, we need one of them to come out and say, you know what? We're taking your property and we're not taking it for any other reason except economic development. Um, and it has to be in a state that has, uh, under its state constitution, has sanctioned that, for example. So the, the, the number of states out there, because of all the successful reform, um, there's probably relatively few states where revisiting the Kelo Doctrine can happen right away, um, or or it, it's only going to happen in a couple of states. And we need a particularly brash, arrogant government official, uh, and and there are, there are I think a few of those left um, to bring the to bring the case. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that is the the big difficulty we have, and in a certain way, we're victims of our own success, because not only is it already illegal to do a Kelo-style taking in most of the states in the country, but Kelo-style takings are still incredibly unpopular. Uh, there, there was a case we had earlier this year in New York where uh, a local government agency was going to take uh, a huge chunk of a local dairy farm just to hand it over to a local cheese manufacturer. And th this was perfect. It was the Kelo issue. It, it gave me a wealth of cheese puns. <laughs> and we were involved in that case for, uh, you know, actually several hours, I think. Yeah, I don't think uh, I we, ever heard of it. That's, oh, that's funny. No, we, we agreed to, to represent the property owner and we were excited to have a vehicle to overturn Kilo and the, the cheese factory, to its credit, uh, sort of got, got a look at how this was going to play in the court of public opinion and said, never mind, we, we don't want this land if you're taking it through eminent domain. And so it's very difficult both to find a place where the government's willing to try this and find a government agency that is willing to stick to its guns rather than turn tail as soon as it faces the prospect of, of being on the other side of another kilo. Uh, I, I don't think anyone on the other side of the original kilo decision is super happy with the decisions they made that led them to that place in their lives. And so it's hard to find someone else who is willing to pick the same fight and can actually sustain that fight instead of just losing to, to IJ in the lower courts. So 
All signs point to the fact that if such a case arises, it, it, it the court is likely to take it up. We're, we're optimistic that they would uh, go the right direction. When that happens, what exactly is it that IJ and other proponents of property rights are hoping that they'll say? Because we've always we've always said, you know, there are obviously legitimate uses of eminent domain, and you know, and that we've that you know, setting that all aside, um, you know, is is it even possible in that circumstance to overcorrect? You know, could they? Um, say, oh yeah, you know, you know. In fact, we're going to take it off the table. Like, what, what exactly are we looking for when they do revisit this um, in a ruling that we say this is this is a, the gold standard? I, I don't think it's possible to overcorrect from the current state of federal eminent domain law. Uh, R- Ronald Coe is always used to joke whenever anyone asked him what the optimal size of government was, he would say, if you have a friend who weighs 500 pounds and he asks you what his ideal weight is, the correct answer is less. Uh, and so, too, with uh, the current scope of em- eminent domain power, uh, on, at least as a matter of federal law, uh, I, I think the rule we're looking for is the rule that the Constitution means what it says, that eminent domain can be used for a public use, that it can't be used just for purposes of economic development. It can't just be used by, the gov- by a government agency that wants to eliminate its enemies, uh, that eminent domain is for what the Constitution says it's for which is a public use. Uh, And I think overturning Kelo is a big step towards restoring that basic constitutional understanding. And a victory like that would potentially mean big things for Brinkman's and these, you know, even these other sort of permutations of the eminent domain fights that we're, we're seeing in the years since Kelo. That that's right. So the Supreme court in, in overturning Kilo, will be saying, we're taking property rights seriously. We're taking eminent domain seriously. And that will have salutary effects on all of the different permutations of eminent domain, including the pretextual takings, the common carrier takings, um, perhaps allow people to challenge the, the necessity and scope of particular takings. Um, and so the, you know, the property rights revolution that, that we were part of, um, that started with the, the Kilo case, um, will continue to carry on, both at the Supreme Court, in state Supreme Courts, and in legislatures across the country. Well, thank you both for, for joining me. Keep up the good fight. Thanks to everyone for listening. If you enjoyed this discussion and would like to hear more like it, you can find more episodes of Deep Dive wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe.